So like everything, uh, this is a unique press conference to have and uh, excited to be in game week uh, more than anything and uh, looking forward to watching our team play and compete. Um, this group has endured a lot going back to when we started up in January and uh, you know going through a really, really good offseason uh, with Coach, Coach Thunder and his staff, the leadership that we've put together, uh, working with our guys on growing as, as leaders and connecting. Uh, and then get into spring ball and, and things are exciting and going good. And then all of a sudden, March 7th, we break for spring break. Think we'll see these guys in 10 days. And next thing you know, it's June. And uh, they've been through a lot, you know, staff and players um, come back. And, and I thought did a tremendous job with all the things that were in place with the COVID protocol. And, and uh, as you know, uh, when the students returned, things changed uh, and having the pause in our camp when we did. And, uh, you know, whether it was positive tests or contact tracing, but uh, to finally be on the other side of that um, and to have our team back, I'm very proud of the resiliency of this group and uh, the way they've stuck together through uh, all the unknowns, the ups and downs of are we playing, are we not playing, uh, having to move our opening game back, all the civil unrest. Um, the team just keeps fighting and, and uh, fighting together. And I think that's one thing that NC State, in my opinion, does extremely well. Uh, obviously, going back to Jimmy V, but never, never quit. And I think that that resiliency is something that this team takes personally and has done a tremendous job. And so they're very excited to be on the other, uh, other side of this with a game in sight and look forward to playing our first um, of three in-state opponents. And this is a game that goes back. Um, it's, uh, the longest continuous rivalry between two ACC schools and the third longest in the nation. Well, it's a game that's been played since 1910. And a game that's gone back and forth uh, in my tenure here. And we have great respect uh, for Wake Forest and for Coach Clawson and his staff. And uh, obviously, they have the benefit of playing one game and, and having that game under their belt. Uh, as we all know, uh, people talk about the improvements teams can make from week one to week two, and I know that's something that they have as an advantage. Uh, looking at them as a football team, you know, they have their systems. They're very sound. Uh, they do not beat themselves. They don't um, turn the football over. They create a lot of takeaways defensively. They don't get penalized. They put themselves in positions that way to win games. And they're a very unique style of, of zone read offense with the mesh and the RPO game um, and how it works timing wise in the backfield. Uh, they lost a lot of skill on offense, but the kids that they have um, showed a lot of athleticism in that game. Their tailbacks are, are returning players with a lot of statistics behind them and have good speed and strength. I think they have a good blend there at their tailback position. You can see the athleticism um, of Donovan Green, number seven, and, uh, and Roberson, uh, number five, and, and I think uh, found a playmaker in the slot with Morin. Um, so you can kind of see who they've replaced their playmakers with and, and what those guys are capable of. As always, their offensive line plays well together, um, and they play very, very up-tempo offense. You know, the no huddle has a lot of different versions in college football. This is, in my opinion, one of the fastest – uh, of those that we'll face. Uh, defensively, uh, very good front seven, very experienced front seven, and, and they showed a little more depth in their D-line than they have in the past in that rotation. But they return a lot of guys that have made a lot of plays, and obviously Basham is, is a player that uh, we have great respect for, not that we don't, the rest of them we do, um, but he is a, a, a very tough, big, athletic defensive end that anchors their front. Their linebackers play downhill. Uh, they understand their scheme. They've got good pressures that they run and disguise well. And then on third down, uh, they do a lot of different things. Um, and they're different each week in their approach. And I think they're very sound in how they attack offenses. Um, so, you know, like any game, it comes down to complementary football. And, and for us, uh, we need to take care of the football on offense. We need to stay on the field. We need to be physical uh, and, and do the things that we can do and take advantage of the plays that are there. You know, defensively, 
you have to do a good job of getting off the field, you know, and I think any tempo offense struggles when they can't get their first first down, you know, and it's just managing that throughout the game and creating some short fields and field position. Last year in our game with them, uh, we were pinned inside the 10 multiple times by their punter. We turned the football over. We didn't give ourselves a chance. And, and in any game, I think it starts with you not beating yourself. And that's a huge point of emphasis for this football team. And uh, I look forward to watching them go out there and do it. You know, I'm excited. We announced our captains yesterday, and, and those four young men uh, have great respect them uh, earning that responsibility and I know they're excited about what comes with it and uh, obviously you also saw Isaiah Moore um, was put into the number one jersey yesterday and, and super uh, excited for him he's earned that he represents our football team as a person as a student as an athlete and uh, what he's doing uh, right now in our community as well is just a, a standout individual that's been through a lot that has earned a lot of respect, not just on our football team, but on our campus. And so with that, you know, game one to me, it's about getting out with these guys and letting them play and have a good time doing it, be physical and executing at a high level and playing complimentary football. You know, we have um, a very good specialist group that has to be a big part of this game for us and special teams play a huge role. And uh, as we've seen watching college football here, um, there's been some very sloppy games. There's been some very clean games. And obviously, you want to be one of those teams that goes out and executes. And uh, it's going to be fun to see these guys this week in practice. This will be the uh, probably the biggest group we've had back. Um, we're about 95% of as far as having all of our guys back now. Some of them are still out from, from injury. But you know, most of our roster is able to practice and compete right now. And so for us as coaches, it'll be fun to have those guys all out on the field together again. Uh, with that, I'll open it up. All right, Jonas Pope, you want to start us off? Hey, Coach, thanks for your time. Um, you guys make it a game week, but unfortunately you start with some bad news announcing this morning that um, Lewis won't be playing with you guys. Was that a continuing from last year's injury or something that happened at camp, or was it, was it COVID-related? Could you give us like what happened and why he's sitting out this year? Yeah, it's not COVID related. It's just a continuation of what he's been dealing with. And, and so for Lewis, the best thing for him was to become a coach. He's excited about that. Uh, he's been around the guys every day and, and he brings great energy to the group and has tremendous respect from the coaches and his teammates. And um, that's kind of where it is. Aaron Beard. Hey, Dave, uh, I was curious. I'm sure you've been watching games and observing what's gone on from afar. Uh, have you been in contact with some of your friends and coaching to kind of say, hey, what's what's it been like with everything going in, what to watch for, what the, the, the little headaches you're going to have to deal with maybe compared to a normal time? Uh, not since the games have started. We talked a lot in the summer and through uh, fall camp. Um, a lot of the conversations – were really about practice. You know, there were so many changes in how we were going to practice that uh, I had a lot of conversations with colleagues in the business. But, you know, the game day aspect of it, it's pretty straightforward um, on what we can and can't do. And, and obviously, all the testing that takes place, there's a lot of things that are just standardized for us. But uh, that's where it's been for me. Uh, Joe Giglio, what you got? Hey Dave, you mentioned the resiliency of this group. What's realistic to expect from Tim and the offense given all of the off-season obstacles? Yeah, you know, I think it comes down to uh, you're not going to see the whole playbook, obviously. You know, I think as we got into training camp, we were able to install a lot. Uh, those two weeks where they kind of backed everybody down in the summer uh, where we had like the 20-hour rule, we were allowed to do a lot of walkthroughs. And so – he was able to get a lot of things coached in that situation. And we were starting to install quite a bit. And, and once we hit the slowdown and, and lost a lot of guys during that eight day window, um, it, it was really a time where he settled in on what do we need to have, you know, at the beginning of the year and really repping those things as guys came back. So I think you're going to see the offense grow as the season goes. Um, not going to be a, a deal where in game one, everything that he has, he can do. And I think 
part of that will be his personnel as he goes forward too. You know, just seeing how guys respond on game day. And you think you know who your guys are um, going into the first game, but as we all know, some guys all of a sudden – uh, will emerge on game day as a playmaker, and, and that will change some of the things that you do. But uh, it will be different than, um, you know, the whole thing's different, really how he calls it and, and the different things he can do within the system. So you'll see some formation similarities, but the system itself will be a lot different. Andrew Schnicker. You talked about um, Isaiah Moore getting the number one and what that means. And obviously with the leadership responsibilities that come along with that, does that take on an – does having that player take on an added importance this year with everything in terms of keeping the guys accountable for their behavior um, off the field and everything else? You know, I think that depends on the individual. I think that's part of who Isaiah is. Andrew, I think that's something that he'll take on his plate because he likes – that responsibility of holding people accountable. I think he looks at himself not only as uh, somebody that leads by how he plays and how he acts, but he really does have a voice with this team and has no problem speaking from the heart uh, about things. And, and so I do expect him to take on a bigger leadership role, not because of the jersey number. I think that just validates it because of who he is. You know, if he was wearing 41, he wouldn't be any different as far as how he leads this football team. Brett Friedlander, what you got? Brett, are you there? All right, let's move on to Mike Topher. Good afternoon, Coach. Um, you referenced last year's game in Winston-Salem, and during that span, you guys obviously had a ton of guys playing that might not normally play due to injury and other things. How much of a difference does that make game planning and going into game week and playing Saturday, having a lot of those guys who have already experienced Wake Forest and what they're about? Well, it's hard um, to put experience into a player. You can't do that. And so, you know, last year we were forced to play – a lot of freshmen uh, due to those injuries. And, and so those freshmen now have that in their background to draw from, and that's valuable for them, having played not just Wake Forest, but played in games. Um, you know, we were playing guys out of position in that game last year. We had safeties and nickels playing corner uh, against them. So we don't have to do that now, which is obviously a huge benefit. You know, you can play guys in the position they were recruited to play, that they have the best skill set to play in. And so it's nice to have that. You know, the biggest thing for us uh, in this game in particular, and you saw it in, in a lot of the openers, you know, there's going to be a lot of rotation. I mean, there's starters, but there's going to be guys that play as much as the starters because of the first game, the tempo, uh, all the things that go with it, and the time lost. You know, there's players that were out um, not only for an eight-day pause, but they were out for contact tracing for an additional 14 days, and that's going to set them back where we can't expect them to play 80 plays. You know, so we have those things going on within the roster and the depth charts where the depth is going to be um, definitely something that we have to be able to take advantage of in the rotation and the depth has to perform well. Coach Brett's having some mic issues, but he asked me to ask the question. He said, uh, you mentioned the advantage of having played a game already, but is there an advantage to being able to scout Wake from the game it has already played? as well as the unknown of them not having tape to watch of you? Yeah, I think there is. You know, I, I do think from a playing standpoint, um, getting on the field with your team and seeing them play a game is a huge advantage for your own well-being as a coach. Uh, the, the scouting aspect obviously gives us an advantage to have film on who they're replacing their, their lost starters with and how they're using them. Um, for them not to have film on, you know, how Tim's going to call it or Tony's going to call it obviously helps us. But, you know, those guys had a lot of film as play callers at other places that I'm sure they're using. So, you know, I think it's the personnel piece maybe that is the biggest advantage for the team that hasn't played because you can see their guys and they can't see ours. Uh, 
Gary Hahn, you have a question and then a reminder, Gary, to mute yourself afterwards because you've been popping up. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been trying to be uh, very, very quiet. Dave, on your uh, depth chart, you got a position F with Dylan Parham and uh, Dylan Ottenreed there. Is that kind of a hybrid H-back type uh, position? Could you describe that and how it fits in the offense? Yeah, it is. You know, our, our Y is more of our inline player and our F uh, is is going to align in a lot of places, you know. And so our tight ends have a lot of different assignments and alignments within the system. And so that's just a way to categorize them that way. Uh, Corey. Uh, Coach, obviously with the loss of Lewis Asus, uh, there's a, another change in the position for linebacker. Uh, we saw with the um, release coming out that now Peyton Wilson being listed as the weak side linebacker, but also the, uh, the Sam linebacker being added as opposed to the, the Buck linebacker. What was the idea for the change there and what do you expect position there? Uh, Sam, Mike, and Will is just how Tony's always done it with his system. So that was regardless of Lewis being here. That's how that would have been. Um, with regard to the lineup, you know, Tony is cross-trained. I've talked about that a lot through fall camp. These guys and, and with um, Drake being able to play multiple spots and Levi um, in the rotation that we're going to need because, you know, again, Peyton, Isaiah, Jalen Scott, you know, we expect to play a lot of these kids at linebacker and there will be a rotation where you see multiple guys in and out um, so we can play fast and we have to be able to match their tempo and also have fresh bodies to do so. And, and so there will be a lot of rotation at that spot. And, and we look at uh, where you see or positions guys that, you know, in our opinion, have earned the right to be out there as starters, whether they're out there the first play or not, they're going to play a lot of reps. Thank you. Yep. Joe Gillio. I got two for you, Dave. You moved Icky to guard. Is that just to get your five best blockers on the field at the same time? Or do you yeah, think so that's a position? It, exactly. Well, Icky was a guard in high school, so it's a position yeah. he's played. And uh, for us to be able to get our top five out there, we felt that having Tyrone and Icky on the left um, allowed us to do that. You know, you see Witt and Joe on the right. Um, and then Grant at center. And, and then behind those guys, we've got some depth you know, where we can rotate on the other line. Icky can always bounce back out to left tackle, um, you know, if Tyrone gets tired. Uh, Tim McKay's had a great camp for us, too, and he's a guy that we expect to see in the game. So there's some rotation that will happen again um, throughout the game, but that was our way to get what we felt like was our most experienced uh, five offensive linemen out there. And then normally you play Wake late in the season. What do you think will be different, maybe mentally, about opening the season with Wake? Yeah, I mean, where we play them is really up to the ACC. The only game that really has been our last game for the recent years is UNC. So um, I think the mindset of opening with a conference game is no different than opening with a Power 5 non-conference game. You know, I think the antennas go up. It's, it counts for more in the guys' opinions and, and obviously for a league statistics. And so you're going to have that urgency in training camp, that urgency in, in your – um, conversations you're having about who we're up against, and it's a lot different than opening up with a non-Power 5 team when it comes to the urgency you feel from the players and the staff. All right, I don't see any hands raised. Does anybody have anything else? All right, I see we got some newbies on here that don't know how to use the little hand raise icon. So, um, uh, Tim Peeler, what you got? Coach, um, obviously nothing's been normal for the last um, six months, but how much does getting ready to start this weekend help return some normalcy to the university campus, to the Raleigh community, all of those different things? And what impact does that have on uh, your guys? Yeah, I think we're starving for a routine. And so this allows us hopefully to have one, you know, just to get into game week and know that, uh, we have an opportunity to have back-to-back -back similar weeks as we move forward because um, we've had the opposite. You know, every day has really been 
a day where change could happen. And hopefully as we get into these games, if they continue to roll the way they are, you can get into that. This is what your Monday looks like, your Tuesday, your Wednesday, and so on. And, and the guys can have a routine and the coaches can have a routine in their lives. And following that, the, um, the fact that uh, your guys participated with other athletes last week and, um, and talking about the um, um, racial unity and, and other things that are going on that are sort of uh, happening at the same time as uh, the unnormal parts that we're going through right now. Tell me what that did for their mindset. Well, it's an event that uh, they've been wanting to have for a long time. And I think the ability to have all the student athletes together uh, and do that, it was a, it was a great day. Uh, it was very well organized by Isaiah and Sack um, and the other student athletes. I thought there was tremendous thought um, and expression. Uh, the speakers did a phenomenal job uh, of speaking on PAC United and, and what that stands for and the awareness, education, and action that they want that platform to have from the student athletes to the campus, to the community. And, and it's really about having empathy and listening and understanding and, and being there with them through their pain and uh, acknowledging the fact that, you know, all of us can't completely understand what other people go through, but we want to sit there and support them and, and be next to them with it and help them get through it and support them. And I thought it was a great day. Uh, I thought it showed a lot from our student athletes, from our administration, uh, from our support staff and everyone that was a part of it. And, you know, not everybody's gonna understand it. And I, that's okay. I think everyone just has to have empathy right now and understand that there's a lot of people in pain and it's, uh, it's not about politics. It's about heart. Uh, it's about love and it's about being better people to each other and that's what this is right now and I'm very proud um, to be a part of what NC State stands for. Uh, Larry Sorensen. Dave, thanks for your time today. Clearly uh, football coaches don't like flying by the seat of your pants but this has created so many changes during the last month or so. Has there been anything that really surprised you that turned out to be a bigger issue than you thought it would? And has there been any last minute phone call that you said, no, I really hadn't thought about that. Yes, we'll deal with it. Something that really surprised you. You know, I think the biggest challenge in all this has been the contact tracing piece. Um, you know, we're all going through testing the same way. We're all doing the CDC protocols with masks and, and social distancing and, and uh, sanitizing things a certain way. Um, but the way people are being contact traced from what we're seeing is different school to school. There isn't really a unified way of doing that. And I think that's been the biggest issue where you have, in our case, um, multiple tests a week where guys are completely healthy and, and passing tests but are unable to come you know, work on their skills because somebody that they were around at a certain point in time uh, has symptoms or has a positive test. So that, that has been the hardest piece to manage. And as you all know, the symptoms for this, uh, there's many, many symptoms. So a guy can wake up with a stuffy nose and all of a sudden his three roommates can't come in until that player passes a test. And, and so you can have a position group be completely healthy and not be able to come into the building for a long period of time uh, and so that's been challenging. You know, I think that's the hardest part of this for us. And I'm not sure how it is at other campuses, but just the unknown of losing guys to things where they're not in harm's way right now um, because of that's what's best by CDC protocol and, and the people on campus. And so you just got to kind of work with what you have and do the best you can that day and, and uh, continue to work through all the things that go with it. Um, as far as phone calls go, yeah, you get crazy phone calls all the time right now, you know, and you just kind of shake your head and, uh, all right, what can we do about it? And I'm just trying to be solution-based, you know. I think it's really easy right now to be negative with all the things that are going on. Uh, that doesn't fix anything. Uh, I've told our players, our coaches, we need to take a positive mindset in the face of this adversity. And if we're a team that handles chaos better than other teams, we're giving ourselves an edge. And so that's something we've challenged ourselves here to try to do day in and day out. Uh, but it is challenging, you know, it is. And there's constant times where we're holding each other to that standard to let's find a solution. Complaining fixes nothing. And so for us, that's really been where we've been day in and day out, hour to hour with this thing, Larry. 
Jonas Pope. Coach, you guys get so much energy from the crowd at Carter Finley, especially at night, but you, know, you guys won't have that this weekend. Um, does that even matter, like once the ball is kicked off, or have you talked to you guys about making sure they bring their own energy on the sidelines to kind of give you guys some kind of edge? Yeah, well, we definitely have to have that. You know, we've talked about offense, defense, special teams, and then our team, you know, our sideline team has to be great supporting each other. Um, but, yeah, it'll be unique playing in an empty stadium. Uh, we do have some pretty sweet cutouts over there. I saw Zach Galifianakis' face, and Bill Cower was in the crowd yesterday during our mock game. So there's some comedy relief in the stands right now. But uh, it's no, not having the students there, not having our fans, our parents, um, that's hard, you know. And to say that we don't get energy from them would be a lie. We do. Um, but we know they're going to be cheering us on from far. And hopefully this is just a thing that we deal with for one week. We don't have another home game in September. So, you know, our fingers are crossed that things can change possibly after that. Uh, Joe Giglio. Dave, I see an or there with Porter Rook. Has he done in camp to impress you to kind of get that or there? Uh, he's just consistent. He makes plays every day. He's the same guy. He's, he's uh, for a freshman. You know, it's hard that first semester, particularly with what they're dealing with here. And, and Porter is very mature. He learns the offense very quickly. He makes plays. He catches the ball naturally. He's a good route runner. More than anything, he's just earned trust because he's the same every day. And I think that's the biggest thing you look for. If you're going to play somebody at a young age, you don't want to not know what you're getting. And for him, it's very consistent performance day in and day out. Two more questions. Brett Friedlander. Okay, I think maybe I've uh, worked my mic out. Can you hear me? Yeah. Outstanding. Uh, so I'm sure you're, you've been following what's going on at Virginia Tech with their game being uh, canceled or postponed this week. As a guy who's already had, you know, schedule changes and all, in the back of your mind, do, you, know, do you think about the fact that you're not really sure if a game's going to get played until actually it's game day, or, or do you tune those kind of things out? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know um, week to week what can happen. I think that's part of why I said this earlier when we moved that game. Uh, the, the league created a schedule that has some bye weeks in it, that has some uh, open end on the backside of things if they have to move games due to other teams' health or circumstances. So, you know, try not to worry too much about that. I know we went through a similar thing here. They're, they were just later than us with students coming back. So. Uh, hopefully their return will be similar to ours. I know they were down in the 40s to what could practice. We had a similar situation here. And, you know, over a period of seven days, you get 10 players back a day and you're back in the hundreds within six days, you know. So hopefully they have a quick return, you know, for their uh, team's well-being up there. But as far as preparing your team, does that play in, in the back of your mind? Is Are we going to play this week or not? That kind of thing? No, I think, you know, obviously seeing Wake play and, and uh, no – Things have come out about anything from that game. You feel good about the one coming up, and, you know, we'll deal with the next one when we get to it. I think that's the only way we can approach it right now. All right, last question, Corey Smith. Hey, Coach, kind of a two-part question here for you. First of all, you see Shaheen Battle being listed as an or with Malik Dunlap on the, on the first depth chart. Uh, first question for you, what has, uh, what has he done in camp to, to be able to earn that spot? You know, at corner, uh, Shaheem uh, and Cecil Powell have been very consistent. Uh, Tayshawn is, is a proven player that's played a lot for us. Uh, Malik played a lot last year, so we feel like there's four corners there that we can play with and rotate. Uh, Aiden White is a freshman who's done a really good job in camp and, and uh, is another young guy we're excited about at that position. And so that's really our group that we have right now. And, you know, we're going to get into this week and continue to evaluate it. I think what the org tells you is there's three guys that right now we look at or four guys that we look at as guys that could be in the game at any point in time. And my second part to that question, is there any update on Chris Ingram? Because obviously we didn't see him listed on the depth chart. Yeah, so Chris is still not ready to go. And so it's just kind of week to week with Chris. And, you know, obviously with the NCAA allowing this really to be a zero year from an eligibility standpoint, you know, um, we're just going to have to see how long it takes for Chris to get back. We certainly want him 
to be healthy and feel good about being out there. And until he feels that way, he won't play.